coming up on Folks, we go one-on-one -on -one with Douglas Glasgow, former vice president of the Urban League in Washington, D.C., about the problem of the black underclass in America. We'll also share the highlights from an exhibit of rare African art, now on display at the New Orleans Museum of Art, all in today's edition of Folks. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Folks, I'm Sonia Massengale. There's a new phrase being used all around American today, it's called the black underclass. But what does that mean? Well we know that at least one third of the population of blacks live in poverty, but according to U.S. News and World Report, most of them, like most poor whites, hold jobs or use welfare temporarily before shifting back into the mainstream. The underclass, in contrast, is the seemingly irreducible core of poor inner city blacks those trapped in a cycle of joblessness, broken homes, welfare, and often drugs and violence. The numbers are increasing. Reports from New Orleans, Louisiana's Urban Center support that claim, with blacks three times as likely to be poor as whites. Later on in today's program, we'll talk to some people who have some ideas about how blacks can go about helping themselves. But first, Douglas Glasgow was in Baton Rouge recently to address a Common Cause seminar at Southern University on the black underclass. Glasgow, a former vice president of the Urban League in Washington, D.C., is one of the first to coin the phrase black underclass as it is used in relation to American life today. In the early 60s, there was a responsible government and a responsible reaction, and so that the federal government undertook a multifaceted war on poverty with two-pronged objectives of ensuring a dis at least a decent subsistence for poverty-stricken families and individuals and opening the doors of economic opportunity to those who were locked out of the mainstream but who were ready to get in. Indeed, black poverty was not just a public issue but had become a policy priority. This is Douglas Glasgow who wrote the newsmaking book, The Black Underclass, published in 1979. This book predicted the increase in the numbers of poor blacks, setting a precedent for future studies. In this equation, black Americans continue to be disproportionately the ones that carry the heavy burden of poverty, as they are three times as likely to be poor than whites. And then we now, in the 1980s, have faced a new part of this equation, because we always knew that blacks were disproportionately those who carried the burden of poverty. But now when we look at the data in the 1980s, we find a new phenomenon. For example, from 1986 to 1987, as poverty was adjusting and the current administration indicated that we were now in a growing economy, we noticed two diverse phenomena. First, from 1986 to 1987, while American economy grew and our nation's leadership spoke of a growing economy, white Americans experienced a slight decrease of 0.5% in poverty. And so that poverty declined for white Americans. And during the same period of time of 1986 to 87, black Americans suffered a 2% increase in poverty. At least part of the growth of the so-called black underclass has been attributed to the change in the American economic sector from the unskilled, high-paying manufacturing jobs to the more highly skilled service occupations. For example, 
Between 1970 and 1983, 23 million jobs were created. Only 1% of those jobs were in manufacturing, and 90% were in the service sector. Almost one half of the 8.8 .8 million black men in America are currently unemployed, thereby reducing the amount of money contributed by black men to black households. This creates what Glasgow calls a permanent lockout of some blacks from mainstream America. We also, in 1985, the New Orleans black mean family income was 13727 compared to non-black mean family income of 27968 Put those in round figures, you're talking the difference of almost from 14000 as against 29000 The overlapping patterns of such statistics are reflective not only of major city in the state of Louisiana, but a nationwide trend which reflects blacks are imperceptibly but steady falling behind. Dr. Glasgow, you speak of the black underclass as a structural phenomenon. What does that mean? It means that large portions of um, the young uh, black population uh, have not been able to find employment. Uh, find employment particularly in the new fields. Uh, as the economy has changed and the marketplace has changed from labor-intensive jobs, the steel mills, the packing house, uh, all of those uh, manufacturing and goods producing jobs which were uh, in the central part of our nation and in our major cities, uh, once our economy has closed those down, uh, sold them over into other countries, um, there has been a complete loss of employment, but there has also, with the new jobs, which are service and jobs of technology, large portions of the black population are not prepared to enter those, and hence they remain detached from the labor force. That disconnection, meaning uh, their lack of labor force participation, lack of working in jobs, uh, makes them a poor population. With no perceptible change in that economy on the horizon, it looks like these people will be out permanently. There seems to be a trend towards blaming the victim in America today for his problems. In terms of the black underclass, just who or what is at fault? Well, I think there are a number of uh, factors involved with the underclass development in this nation. I think one is, of course, the insensitivity of uh, our policy, our nation's policy makers, is that the economy changed um, starting in the mid-70s and the 80s. Uh, uh, the economy changed, uh, the marketplace changed um, visibly. Um, there has been a failure on the part of government as well as our Congress uh, to deal with the question. Uh, it is not only a question of uh, blacks uh, being out of the uh, labor force. Uh, you have in America now a labor force that's available to work, but who need the skills, need the training. And so that this nation, to be competitive and to stay competitive with other nations' workforce, I mean, one of the reasons why we're losing and slipping behind the Japanese economy and some of the other Western economies is that um, those countries have invested in the training of their labor force. We have not. And hence, um, we need a massive training program in this nation to bring um, our uh, committed workforce up to being able to participate in the new economy. The problem of the black and poor is staggering in scope, depth, and complexity. Do you believe that in our lifetime we will see a significant reduction of the numbers of the black underclass? If so, why? If why not, what then? Essentially, um, I think we have to do some things differently and some new things which challenge uh, the very structure of the nation, its economic structure. Uh, for us to get a piece of it, um, to develop a parallel piece, uh, to develop a piece that is connected to, um, it's going to require some new, very bold uh, moves for economic justice and parity on the part of black Americans, and they will not always fit with the tradition. I like to think of it as moving away from uh, the economy of the 40s and 50s and 60s, um, 
Uh, this current administration was very bold in putting forth supply-side economics. Uh, it did not work for black Americans, but it was a very bold, bold stroke, and um, they educated the uh, population of America, our citizens, to accept that as a, an economy. I think we now have a challenge in black America, and that challenge is, is how do we build a viable uh, economic system and an economic structure, and how do we get a, an economy that will support those things that we need. Recently, there's been a shift in the thinking of mainstream America, one that moves the burden of the black underclass to other members of the black community. But whose responsibility is it to help address the needs of the underclass? And how can the black community harness its resources to advance economically as other ethnic groups have in this country? Joining us here in the studio to address these questions and more is Alton Patton. Mr. Patton is a businessman in uh, Baton Rouge and vice president of the Economic Freedom Association here in town. Also, we have Dr. Huey Perry. He's a professor and acting chair of political science at Southern University, and he recently delivered a paper on the impact of black politics in New Orleans. Welcome to folks. Dr. Perry, since we use New Orleans as our urban center, as our indicator for what happens in the urban areas of Louisiana. Is there any evidence at all that the black politicians in New Orleans have helped the economic base of New Orleans? Well, the record is not uniformly clear, but what there is suggests that the answer is, in fact, positive. That, and we don't want to put the burden strictly on black politics. We want to look at the political structure in general. And in fact, if, if one does that, one finds that, for instance, between 1979, uh, 1969, rather 1985, that the proportion of the population that is middle class in New Orleans increased from 10 percent to 31 percent. And that largely had to do with the fact that two of the most liberal mayors in the city's history deliberately expanded the pie of government to make room for blacks to have jobs in city government. So the record is not entirely clear in the sense that poverty still exists, but there has been some progress, yes. Okay. There are almost 500 black elected officials in the state of Louisiana. That's second in the entire nation That's right. in elected black officials. Is there any evidence that black politicians helped a lot of poor blacks? Well, there is, uh, the, the record is even more difficult than, than, than my first answer. Poverty is really an intractable problem. It's been with us from you, uh, since the history of humankind and it probably will be with us forever. Uh, but having said that, one finds some evidence in the structure of black politics, which in fact suggests that black politicians have been helpful. That, that's not a popular view. But for instance, if you look at uh, the extent to which blacks have been hired in city government, and if you look at two occupational categories in city government, the clerical and service maintenance uh, area sections, you will find that there's been a tremendous increase in the number of blacks hired in those, in those categories. The blacks actually yeah. hired by the city government. Right, right. Okay. And that becomes a way, and those are the occupational categories in which blacks tend to dominate. So that becomes uh, a basis for for providing stable, regular jobs for low-income blacks who perhaps would not ordinarily have, have jobs. So the charge is often made that black politics don't do anything, uh, doesn't do anything for low-income blacks, but that's not necessarily true. Okay. Um, Mr. Glasgow, Dr. Glasgow did indicate in his speech that in New Orleans the mean family income of a black family is almost $14,000 a year less than that of a non-black family. That is a huge, huge gap in, in, in an average, say, number of people's living. I mean, that is, a, that is an enormous gap. Is that going to close at all in the New Orleans area? And well, it will, it will only close to the extent that blacks can make progress in finding private sector jobs. That's really why you have that tremendous gaps, gap because most blacks are employed in government or public sector jobs, whereas, whereas the majority of whites are employed in private sector jobs. And as you well know, there's a significant difference in pay between private sector and public sector jobs. 
sir. jobs. That brings us to Mr. Patton and why you're here. You are a local businessman and vice president of the Economic Freedom Association in Baton Rouge. And we always hear jobs, jobs, jobs. What we need is more jobs in the black community. Are jobs the answer? I think that's certainly um, the start. However, I don't think that that's the only thing that's important. Uh, along with that, uh, there should be some training uh, with uh, that group of how to take care of your money once you earn it. Uh, there's been too much talk about not having jobs, and we've seen, <coughs> excuse me, in the black community, uh, people with jobs don't handle money properly. And I think the reason being is that uh, there's a lack of understanding of how to handle money. Uh, of course, I'd rather see uh, us with jobs first and then take on all these other responsibilities after rather than not having the jobs at all. Well, what is the role that black businesses can play in helping to provide those jobs that we need? We, first of all, we at uh, EFA, and I'd like to put a plug in for EFA, we're trying to sensitize the black community to understand uh, us as black business people. Uh, in most cases, we have the same thing to offer as other groups. And when you look at the statistics and see that blacks spend almost $218 billion, and we're spending 95% of that money with other groups, then you can see the problem that we have with offering jobs to other people. For an example, uh, myself, if I had the support of 10% of, of my black community, then that way I could be able to put at least four or five people to work. And in my opinion, this is where it's going to start if we plan to get off square one, is to be able to support and to sensitize ourselves among each other as to how to handle this situation. There's a current attitude, though, among some business owners, both black and white, that black people don't want to work. Uh, you've heard that time and time again. Do you find that to be true in, in your business, for example? I'm very sorry to say uh, that has a lot of truth to it. Uh, as I stated earlier, there are some problems along those lines. But again, that's, that go back to that old problem of sensitizing our blacks to what they need to be for them to stay on the particular jobs. But what does that mean that they don't want to work? I mean, I haven't, I have yet personally to meet someone who was without a job who didn't want one, who would prefer well, to live off the fat of the state, so to speak. Let me cite you an example that just happened today. Uh, we needed some uh, carpet installed at uh, Southern today. Uh, and I call about six or seven installers. All of them had excuses. They weren't working but they had excuses. Now that tells me that that person don't want to work. And this go on and on and on. And in a lot of cases where they need to work to furnish the habit at that particular time, when that's over, that's it. Just that one day. Not a job, a permanent job, a particular day. Uh, there were other instances where we tried to get people to work and the first question they would ask, how long are you going to be gone? Now, I'm not saying that that's true with every situation, because it's not. But in the areas, and let me use the word, clutch situations, that happen an awful lot. Dr. Perry, what do you have to say about that particular situation? I want to diffuse it. It's, it's a dangerous thing to say, well, black people don't want to work. Of course, most of us do. But what is this mentality that prevents some of the people who really need it from going to work and doing what they need to do to get ahead? Well, I'm not familiar with the extent of the problem that M Mr. Pat is. I have to take his word on that. Uh, uh, most people that I've come into contact with are uh, very much a part of the work ethic and part of the workforce and, and take pride in their work. Uh, but w when you get to this on the class notion, I'm pretty sure Mr. Patton's comment is right. You do find some people who have not been socialized into the work ethic and perhaps uh, reflect behavior that would not be conducive for for the, for the job market, but I'd like to, I'd like to make another comment on this, if, if I may. Uh, the fact that Mr. Patton represents business group also suggests a way that politics can be helpful. One of the things that public officials can do, black public officials can do, and and, and have done in this state, is to push for for, for minority set aside contracts, for so that black business 
uh, groups can get a fair share of state dollars, which would be helpful to expand in their business businesses and making it possible for them to hire some of the people that Mr. Patton referenced. Excellent point. Mr. Patton, how do you feel about minority set-asides and do they help? Well, uh, all of the programs are only good if they are workable. And when I say workable, if they are conducive to the people that should have them. Uh, you speak of that. Uh, there's always been ways with our present policy to escape or uh, to skirt that issue in terms of the black set-aside working for minority people. Uh, for an example, uh, just recently one of my uh, friends was in business, won a bid. Then after winning the bid, he could not get a bond to take care of the job. So, so that's, on one hand it worked, and on another it doesn't. Mm -hmm. so, so these little things here, uh, the average person can't understand this, but it's a problem with that set aside, the way it's being executed. Okay, we are discussing the black underclass. I want to reiterate that point, which is not just the art of being poor, the act of being poor in America, but the hardcore inner city urban poor that seem to be trapped in a cycle of poverty. And my last and final question to you, Dr. Perry, would be, what is the future? What is the future for these people? I'm afraid that the future is not, is not very bright at all. And if you look at it from a politics standpoint, the political process can be useful for helping largely middle-income blacks. It has helped low-income blacks as well, but in terms of that, that lowest level of the black poor, the underclass, the political process has not been very helpful, so I don't hold much hope. In the case of New Orleans being the urban center, can we fa safely assume that the New Orleans statistics would hold true for the rest of the state of Louisiana? Would you like to take that one on? I think we're a little bit better off here in Baton Rouge than uh, New Orleans. Uh, I think that's a good focal point to start, but I think we're a little bit better off because we have businesses moving from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. In fact, the latest one that I was in contact with is Repair. You might be familiar with it. It's moving because they said the market there is pretty much sell, and they're moving into Baton Rouge for a market here. But uh, I don't want people to understand or to think that there isn't some good in this. I think the fact that we're not recognizing it is a start out of the pits. And if we continue this and keep sensitizing the people that we need to, I think that we'll be on our way. And the first thing that we need to understand and recognize that they're, they're problems. There are problems that need to be addressed. Some of us don't want to address the problems, thinking they're going to go away. But I agree with the doctor, they're only going to get worse unless we address them in the manner that they should be addressed. And that is a subject that you'll be hearing more of on folks, and I'll be calling on both of you experts in the field for your help. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. We close today's program with another visit to the New Orleans Museum of Art for an ongoing exhibit of very special dimensions. It's called Shapes of Power, Belief, and Celebration, and each piece of this exhibit comes from a private collection in New Orleans.
The African Art Exhibit will be on display at the New Orleans Museum of Art until April 16th. And that's all for today. Be sure to join us next week for another edition of Folks. Bye-bye. Thank you.